Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Well, we have arrived. It's Palm Sunday, and I hope everybody has their palms that were blessed last night at the Vesper service. Now we begin the final week. We call it Holy Week, the final week, as we get ready to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's begin with this message this morning on Palm Sunday 2024. Now throughout history, men have tried to conquer other men. Wars and rumors of war, empires and kingdoms, but also even our daily relationships. Some people try to, as they say, lord it over you. Rulers have conquered cities, uh, emperors have conquered the entire nations, and it, sometimes the even kings try to conquer the entire world. And I ask myself, why? Why do that? Why bring so much suffering to the people, the masses that are living on this earth? And maybe it's just because of power and greed and so forth and money. But there remains one uncharted territory that has eluded the men throughout all of history. The unconquered territory is a human heart. Its sole conqueror is Christ the Lord only. Is he not our creator? Has he not fashioned us in the womb of your mother? He knows everything about us, doesn't he? how many hairs are on our head or how many have fallen away, the color of our eyes, but he wants our heart, doesn't he? I was reading in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and no one can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to every man and woman according to their ways and according to the fruit of their doings. So I'd like to call Jesus Christ the King of Hearts. Our heart is desperately wicked and we need somebody who can heal that desperately wicked heart. And I was thinking about, you know, when you babies are born and they look so cute and they goo and they slobber and all that stuff and and you have to a lot of maintenance to a newborn and as they grow up it's a little bit if you put two of them in the crib and one rattle there's going to be a fight and uh, who's going to win so that's kind of like the desperately wicked heart to me even though they're a cute little baby, they all need Jesus Christ who created them. We celebrate one of the great feasts in the church today, the Feast of Palm Sunday. Today we gather together to celebrate Christ's triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Today we celebrate Christ as the King who enters hopefully our own personal Jerusalem, our hearts. Today's feast is a momentary feast and joy and celebration because tonight we begin the services of the bridegroom. The icon of the suffering servant will be brought into the middle of the church and we'll have our first bridegroom service tonight. 
The mood will change from joy this morning into the triumphal entry in Jerusalem to one of solemnity, almost of sorrow this evening as we lead up to the great sacrifice that Jesus Christ willingly gave himself on the cross for the salvation of mankind. This feast of Palm Sunday has been celebrated in our church since the earliest days of Christianity. But the use of palms in connection with the religious celebrations goes all the way back to the Old Testament times. If you notice in the book of Leviticus chapter 23, it is one of the great feasts that are listed in the book of Leviticus. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot in the Hebrew. It was celebrated at the temple in Jerusalem. The palm branch was used as a visual tool proclaiming the sovereignty of God as the true king of the Israelites. They used to make little huts and tabernacles and cover the roof with loose palms or whatever they could find and they would dwell in these tabernacles that they could still at night see the stars in, in the sky so they weren't built to code as, you know, as today we have building codes, right? And we don't want rain coming in our house. But back then, the celebration of tabernacles was giving glory to God. And they could see the stars of whom God created. With the expectation of the Messiah and the events of Christ's ministry on earth, word traveled quickly around Judea that Jesus was the one whom the prophets had spoken about and whom everyone was it everyone was expecting. I remember if you read your history, there were many people, men coming that proclaimed they were the Christ or the Messiah, they were false. And so when the real Messiah shows up, there's, there's wonder. Is he a false Messiah or a true Messiah? Well, that was all put to bed the day before when we celebrated the raising of Lazarus, the four days dead. Jesus performed that miracle for the glory of God. Of course, Mary and Martha challenged him and said, if you would have been here sooner, he wouldn't have died because Lazarus was sick. But he, he scolded them. He says, this, his death, he's in a deep sleep right now, and the, the apostles really didn't understand what he was talking about, I guess. But he will rise again. And even Martha says, I know in the last days he will rise again. And you know, we think about the scripture that Jesus says, I am the life. I am the resurrection. He will believe within me, though he die, I shall never die. I will raise him up on the last day. By raising Lazarus from the dead, people were amazed. And it increased it the followers of Christ. He had enough trouble during his earthly ministry of healing lepers and the blind and all that and the lame, and, but he always had trouble with the leadership of the Jewish people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He always had trouble. By raising Lazarus from the dead, it foreshadowed his glorious resurrection at the next Sunday. If you read the Troparians and the Kentuckians this morning, you'll see that there's a reference to the resurrection. Yes, Lazarus did die again. His resurrection was earthly. But he lived another 30 years and he died on Cyprus and tradition tells us he was a bishop. His uh, Relics are in Constantinople today. So now, as I was saying, now that everybody is convinced that this is the Messiah King who will save the Israelites. Christ fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah by entering Jerusalem on the donkey. And if you ever look at a donkey's back, there's a cross on the back of the donkey. Go check it out. Go on the internet and check out what I'm saying you'll see a donkey has a cross. It's almost a, a foreshadowing of Christ going to the cross. Of course, he knew this was his end. Physical end would be on the cross. 
before the third day resurrection. So all of Israel now is preparing to go to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And Christ enters also as the king who will save Israel from the, not from the tyranny of the Roman Empire, which they maybe wanted relief from the Roman boot, but from the curse of death through his own death and resurrection. Maybe Judas thought he came to deliver Israel from the Roman tyranny. And when he found out it, he was talking about a spiritual kingdom, maybe Judas was disappointed. And then, you know, the rest of the story. For the betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, and then the remorse and his suicide. For us Orthodox Christians around the world, we celebrate these events as they happen not only in the past, but also as they happen today. By doing the, by this is one of the 12 major feasts in the church, Palm Sunday. We celebrate Christ as a king who enters in Jerusalem, but also we, he wants to enter into our heart that he created. We try to find all these kinds of ways to uh, be successful in life and maybe we're disappointed. Maybe we need to spend more time in the spiritual realm of seeking the heart of God like David did. Are we allowing Christ to enter our heart? Is there room in our heart for him to come in? Or have we filled it up with all kinds of stuff? Have we locked our heart? Maybe lack of belief? I'll try to do it my way. The world has given us a good pattern of success in their eyes. But success in the kingdom of God is different than the world's success. When Christ comes to our heart, if it's locked, it's probably because of ourself. You know the scripture has said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Right? Someone's knocking at the door. What do you do? If you heard somebody knock at the door, I guess you're going to go answer the door. In, some, in this day and age, if you have a peephole, you're going to be looking through the peephole to make sure who's there. I didn't see a peephole on the door that Jesus knocking on your heart. So how do we solve the problem of letting Christ come into our heart and be the king of our heart? You know, that's the missing piece. I spent a lot of my life trying to fill that, that special piece in my heart that only Christ can fill with other things and all of it was a disappointment. All of it leaves you wanting more. But when Christ comes into your heart and you invite him in and he takes up residence in your heart, then everything is complete. It is complete. If you look around in this generation and see the youth, they seem lost. They see We see tremendous trouble at the universities across the United States. Most of them don't even know what they're protesting about. But, uh, you know, it's like mob rule. How many know the history of what they're protesting about? I would see, if I could, you know, listen children, youthful generation, put down your cell phone and listen to this that Jesus Christ has come to fill your heart with his presence. Of course, there will be scoffers, and there are always going to be scoffers. But I'll tell you, when the end comes, when the end, and it will come, what's going to happen? And we don't know what day or hour that each person will repent and say, Jesus, come into my life, take over. I've messed it up. It's, it's, it's just a mess. Please come in and help. It requires surrender. Do we surrender? Surrendering to the will of God. 
we've been living on this earth doing our thing and our will is preeminent apparently but God says because I created you and I know everything about you the best thing for you to do is surrender to my will and I will set everything in order and you'll be able to think totally differently than you think now we need to surrender our life to the one who gave us life and I've actually heard people say I'm going to sue my parents because I wasn't asked to be born isn't that ridiculous and some of these doctors I don't know where they get their degrees at they say you have to ask the baby permission to change its diaper well <laughs> poppycock on that as I say ridiculous so ridiculous I raised my kids I didn't ask them I just knew they had a dirty diaper and had to be changed it was an awful thing to do but you have to do it and maybe in our in our twilight years of our life maybe our children will have to clean our diapers out I don't know we are being held captive by the enemy and the only freedom we'll have is when we give our life to Christ and let him come in open that door let Christ come in because he says I will come in and have sup with you as it said in scripture so basically we're prisoners of our own devices our own you know the world says march this way I remember in reading the saints that have gone before us they didn't march to the drumbeat of the world they gave their lives up in torture and, and martyrdom because they would not recant Christ they had that surrender they had that living moment by moment of trusting in Christ their their creator either we're a slave to God or a slave to our passions there's no middle road that's the only way to find peace in your heart I don't care about peace in the world because there's wars and rumors of war but the only place you're going to find peace and true joy is when Christ comes in to your heart there's no way to explain it there's no when it happens to you it's a miracle you make him the king because he is the king but you have to make him a willful choice to make him your king and live in total communion with him and the way in which we turn our hearts from the kingdom of self to the kingdom of God is the church has given us tools daily prayer meditation frequent holy communion frequent confession reading and understanding the scriptures through the church fathers because you cannot self-interpret the scriptures you will go off into a ditch and next thing you know you'll start another Christian denomination Protestantism of 25,000 30,000 I don't know how many sects there are now or you know, us Orthodox Christians are to be totally full of gratitude how the church has given us what it, what the church has given us you know people say I can't come to church I'm kind of kind of busy today but if there's a, a football game boy they'll get to that or a baseball game so they change their priority list and they put God at the bottom can't find time to read the scriptures they can't find time to the fast in the 40 days or now we got seven they become their own God it's like a person I said once said one time I think it might have been uh, Abbot Trifon looking in the mirror what do you see are you God or are you a servant of the Most High God because when we come forward for the Holy Communion you'll hear the priest say to you servant of God whatever your name is servant of God is, is that true when you come for the Holy Cup are you a servant of God receiving the most precious body and blood of Christ for the remission of sins and everlasting life Jesus is knocking at the door of our heart remember the ark Noah's ark the side was open for the animals in the and uh, the, Noah's family to come in 
But some day there was a closing of that door. And guess who sealed that door? Had to be sealed from the outside. And the scriptures teach us that God sealed the ark. And what I'm saying is there's going to be a time when the, this door is sealed. And that's it. It's over. The next thing, the next major event will be standing before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of your life. God says, I will share my glory with no one. And by us making choices and doing our thing, are we being, are we glorifying ourselves and not glorifying God? Which he says, I will share my glory with no one. When you come into the sheepfold, then things are going to be totally different. The way you think, the way you act, which you, your want-tos will change. Not to, it used to be have to go to church, now it's I want to go to church. That's a totally different attitude, isn't it? So as we have our palm branches here celebrating the, the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem, keep them with you, take them home, they're blessed, and the look, look at them as a, as a memory for us to think what Christ did as we celebrate the Palm Sunday today. We can see that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came into Jerusalem. The people threw their, clo their cloaks down on the, on the ground. He came in not in a white horse, but on a humble little donkey. And that donkey is really a picture of mankind without God. Untrained. And, but it was totally peaceful with Christ sitting on his back, right? He didn't kick him off or run around and uh, go hee-haw and all that stuff. He, apparently he, he knew what he had to do. Because did not God call the animals to the ark? So he could talk to that donkey. Remember, it was a talking donkey in Scripture, in Old Testament, a prophet. They got in trouble with a talking donkey. The donkey was obedient. Christ sitting on his back, coming into Jerusalem triumphantly. And people cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I think that word Hosanna, if you define it, means uh, God save us. And that's the, only, uh, that's the only salvation we have. God save us. So let these palms remind us that Christ is the king, whether we like it or not. Hopefully we like it that Christ is the king of our hearts. And he's the only true answer to our lives. And if we do proclaim Christ as our king, let us try to make time for him in our daily life. Every moment, getting up, going to bed, everything is all about the Lord. Saying good night, saying good morning, our prayers. There is going to be eternity. Where are you going to be spending your eternity? Church fathers tell us while you're alive, there's the chance of repentance. So let's get repenting. So everything we're doing in our life, our careers, our education, our finances, our home, the basic material needs that we're in our lives, that's all temporary stuff. Even I think St. Peter talked about it. We live in a temporal world because it's all going to burn. But one thing is eternal, and that's our soul. Because someday, God is going to unite that soul with a resurrection body. And then we'll stand before the judgment seat. So there are, there are many roadblocks that Satan throws, the enemy throws at us. But we can be victorious. Those, road, those roadblocks really become invisible when Christ is reigning in our heart. This is a complex world we live in. But Christ is simple. Trust me, I am your God, I created you. Let's get on with living together in total communion. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory forever.